Today we're doing something a little different. For, uh, Don't be scared. Fred Greenwood, can you quite down your groove there? <laughs> Today we're doing something a little different uh, for the sermon. Fred has asked us to, uh, Jen and I, to talk to you a little bit about something we did a few years back. And uh, we thought we would do that. So uh, the idea is to let you know a little bit about a mission trip we took to the Senegal uh, many years ago. And just uh, talk about how God guided us and how we followed God's call for that. So this is what we are going to do. Don't worry, this isn't the sermon. <laughs> Um, just to tell you that uh, one influence in our lives as a couple and a family has been family camp. And uh, we always packed up our five kids and drove them up to Northern Ontario to uh, go to family camp every year. And one of the very first ones that, that we were at together as a family, the speaker was John Miller. And uh, he's from Quebec City. And he was talking on the book of James. And he, he was uh, going with the phrase in the book that says, you have faith, put it into practice. And over and over he'd say, Put, you, put it into practice, put it into practice. So one of the themes of our life became that little phrase and we always uh, have repeated it to each other and tried to find ways to put our faith into practice. And uh, one person we looked up to is my Uncle Roy, who when he was 55 years old, he retired and he spent the rest of his life, almost 20 years with his wife. And every winter they spent the whole winter in a different mission field. And uh, even as they were getting older, they went every year and uh, brought encouragement to the missionaries, brought practical help. My uncle would help with uh, different building projects and, and they went all over the world doing this for the Lord so that their last years would be lived out for the Lord. So that would have an impact on Eddie and I as we talked about our own, <coughs> our own life and what we wanted to do. One of the things too is a couple, we believe that God gives us blessings and the money we receive is for the Lord, it's from the Lord. And so we were thinking, how do we put that into practice? Uh, one thing we noticed too, as uh, we talked to Uncle Roy, is that every three or four years he would come home for a year and would rest, but would also go around and speak to churches and drum up some funding for his mission. And so at, uh, at that time we had an opportunity to purchase a second house and we thought we would use it for the Lord. And we thought that it would be a good use for missionaries that would come home on what they call their furlough, their one year away from the mission field. So we got to know Kathy and Steve Haynar because they went, they were part of uh, Shawnee Baptist Church where we were, any of you know, and most of you know them as a couple. And when they came home on furlough, we offered them the house um, that they could live at so that it would be reasonable for them as they were home and they accepted. So they were there, as you, most of you know, they were there for uh, two different years of furlough. The, the first year they were there, we got to know them very well. We had a great time as uh, landlord and tenant, but we, we just we got to know them as friends. We became close to them, and then they went back to Africa, and then the next time they came home, it wasn't four years because of health reasons, but uh, they spent another year in the same house, and we were so grateful to be able to get to know them. But as we got to know them, we got to see that there are a lot of needs um, that missionaries have while they're away. It needs for encouragement. They feel like they're forgotten in those four years. They're struggling in many things. So we kind of hope that we might be able to help. In the years that the house was not used as a furlough, we used it to uh, rent to people. And so we rented the house like for three years and then they came on furlough for a year and then we rented again for three years and then they came on furlough again. And on the year after, uh, we sold the house to our daughter. Uh, so the house we felt was used for a good purpose. Uh, we never made any money with the house, but we felt that it was a, a good investment and the Lord did, uh, was able to use it. Kathy and Steve uh, Hanars, I'm sorry, uh, we, we learned from Steve and Kathy Hanar that they had um, solar panels uh, where they were in the village where they were and uh, that they were having problems because they were running wires all over the, the house they were living in. They also had a backup generator and the situation was uh, quite uh, difficult there. And uh, he needed some help just to clean this up and get things running and going. And he also mentioned that there is a uh, missionary house 
a, a, village, a town about 400 kilometers from their village that uh, would house some people, missionaries that would come for a period of time, but they only had 50 cycle uh, electricity. And the problem with that is if you come from the States or Canada, the minute you plug it in the outlet, you burn your dryer or your whatever you're plugging in, you just destroy it. So they needed to convert the 50 cycle to 60 cycle. I wonder if you want to Leanne, if you can show some of the pictures. Now this was the hut that we stayed. It's made out of dirt. It's earth with a straw roof. As you can see, we were a little younger back then. <laughs> this is uh, Jan walking through the village. Now this is a village of about approximately 400 people. And uh, as you can see, these are their homes. They're not well off, really an area that's struggling. And uh, Jan had the opportunity to get to meet the people. They don't speak French or English, uh, but at least it was quite friendly people. We enjoyed it. Next one. When I was there, we had to uh, bury the cables for the, the generator, and this is my working crew. <laughs> uh, and they helped me bury the cable, and uh, they just walked over once the earth was plowed in to, carry the, to cover the cable. And as you can see, lovely smile and what, quite willing workers. Yeah. We just love them, and we had a great time with them. This is the reason why Steve and Kathy Hanar were able to go to the mission, is the mission promised them to do, uh, to do a well, because they had to go to the Guyane River, which was quite far away, and uh, in some periods of the year, they just, there was just no water at the river. So, uh, because of the well, they were able to go and live there. Steve and Kathy were there for 20 years, and this is the people at the well. This just shows you some of the electrical <laughs> that was in uh, Steve's house. And as you can see, wires dangling everywhere and a little hookup. It wasn't really safe. <laughs> Next one. This is what uh, I installed at the Katigoo house, which was an electrical panel. It was to replace all these wires that were dangling everywhere. So, and to put the, uh, the, the 60 cycle system in the Katigoo house. Here you see Steve just talking to the people of the village. This gives you an idea what it's like to be a mission out there. You're not walking around and uh, having great crowds of people when you start. You're really a one-on-one -on -one and talking to different people in the village. This man is a boy and the young boy was the one walking around the village with a stick. He would have a stick and he'd walk the old man around, guide him where he wanted to go. Excellent. So this is uh, Kathy and she's doing the same as we were doing but a little bigger crowd with her and when she'd go for a walk in the village people would just come and gather and walk with her. And this I thought I'd show you this with the district I cross in Kedigu. Now this was not in the village. In the village they have nothing like that. It's just grass huts. But in Kedigu, which is a bigger town, they have about a thousand people. And that was the famous discotheque. <laughs> so you can't be more than three people. Anyhow, when, when Eddie saw the, uh, the need for electrical work, it was like a whisper from God because he was, and still is, an expert in electricity. So we decided to make the trip. <coughs> We've already seen the results, but our notes are back. <laughs> the trip wasn't that long. We were a week in the village and a week at the Kedigu house. I keep thinking it was three weeks, but Jan keeps correcting me it was only two weeks. And so uh, we, were, we were only gone two weeks. And there were things, you know, a certain amount of sacrifice, obviously financially, but we had five kids and uh, we had to leave them, which is hard for a mom and dad, I guess. <laughs> no, it was hard. And, but we had to find someone specifically look after Michelle and she spent the two weeks with the Osbournes and hung out with Kelsey. Uh, okay, many of the electrical equipment I had to bring with me. And so we had a lot more uh, material than we had luggage. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting is at that time I used to work for a company called Franklin Empire and they had in that office approximately 60 employees and uh, it was um, owned by a, a Jewish uh, men from uh, Montreal and what happened is the, uh, the week I was leaving they called me into the uh, cafeteria 
and they had quite a few people in the room, and they presented me with uh, five hundred dollars to use as medicine for uh -huh. the, uh, the people of the village. Now I have to tell you that as far as I knew, there was only two Christians in the whole company, myself and one other man, and so it uh, touched me and Jack quite a bit. But it did that. So our motivation for the mission trip was was to put our faith into practice and to try to use our resources and our energy for the Lord. And uh, the family camp that I mentioned earlier, the theme, the theme verse of that family camp, even though we were studying James, the theme verse was Ephesians 2 verse 9, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has works for all of us, and a lot of us might think, ah, uh, yeah, not me, because I'm not very talented, or I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I'm too poor, or whatever excuse we have, but the Lord has work for every single one of us. And um, I stole this from Facebook, it was on uh, Shannon Morrow's thing, so I'm going to read this. Jacob was a cheater, these are people from the Bible, Jacob was a cheater, Peter had a temper, David had an affair, Noah got drunk, Jonah ran from God, Paul was a murderer, Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossiper, Martha was a warrior, Thomas was a doubter, Sarah was impatient, Elijah was moody, Moses stuttered, Zacchaeus was short, and Abraham was old. God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. We have a chance to uh, take over the uh, speaking here. <laughs> speaks to us in many ways. The three ways that I know and I'd like to share with you is one through his word. When you read his word, God can speak to you. The other one is through prayer. When you pray, God can whisper to you. Not only just a whisper, sometimes people feel that God is speaking to them and they hear clearly a message from God. But the third way you hear from God is through others. Mm -hmm. And I feel that through this experience, we have felt the three of them, and quite fortunate for that, because we had people in our lives that gave us an example. We read God's word and felt the calling, and we prayed and we heard God's whisper. Um, the actual going was two weeks, but the whole process, including the house and knowing the Hanars and everything, was an eight-year period. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's wonderful that we were ready to sacrifice this much and we got this much. And so I think it's a wonderful thing. The reason uh, we're speaking today is uh, I know as a church, and maybe not all of you know that, but we sponsor 11 different missions as a small church. We sponsor Chapelle Evangelique Emmanuel, which is a French work in Montreal. We help the pastor and his family there. We support World Vision. World Relief, Gospel for Asia, Logifan, Radio Bible, Daily Bread Ministry, Canadian Sunday School Mission, Camp Livingstone, Samaritan's Purse, and Power to Change. That's 11 different missions that you are all involved with and are funding. And also you are strong uh, prayer people for your missions. And so today we're thinking, what else can we do? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, morning Fred. Thank you, Amy and Jen, for that message. Far more than what I can say up here now is what you folks acted upon, and we appreciate those words and that testimony. Because really, um, this book is a who, what book. And uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, in this book, God says who He is. And in this book, God says what He wants from us. It's a who, what book. And it's all here. And that's what we want to consider this morning. Doing the right thing. Do you want to do the right thing? We all want to do the right thing. And we all have those thoughts of wanting to do the right thing. But yet, we don't know how to go about it oftentimes. So we find ourselves just 
stagnant, staying in that place where we feel as though, though the intentions are there, the desires there, we actually don't go forward. And that reminds me of the story. A man is in bed with his wife when there's a rat-tat-tat on the door. He rolls over and looks at his clock, and it's half past three in the morning. I'm not getting out of bed this time, he thinks, and rolls over. Then a louder knock. So he drags himself out of bed and goes downstairs. He opens the door, and there is a man standing at the door. It didn't take the homeowner long to realize the man was drunk. Hi there, slurs the stranger. Can you give me a push? Now get lost. It's half past three, I was in bed, says the man, and slams the door. He goes back up to bed and tells his wife what happened. And she says, that wasn't very nice of you. Remember that night we broke down in the pouring rain on the way to pick up the kids up from the babysitter, and you had to knock on that man's house to get up, to get started, to get us started again? What would have happened if he told us to get lost? But the guy was drunk, says the husband. It doesn't matter, says the wife. He needs our help, and it would be the Christian thing to help him. So the husband gets out of bed again, gets dressed, and goes downstairs. He opens the door, and not being able to see the stranger anywhere, he shouts, Hey, do you still want to push? And he hears a voice cry out, Yes, please. So still being unable to see the stranger, he shouts, Where are you? And the drunk replies, over here on the swing. <laughs> oh, boy. Sometimes we want to do the right thing and we realize. <laughs> All right, well, this morning we are talking about the right thing. And, uh, you know, we've been discussing the last few weeks with the change in my schedule. <laughs> How can we complement the ministry here? And there's so much going on. And uh, we see the missions and missionaries that we're supporting. And I'm glad that Eddie and Jen had an opportunity to share something that they were involved in back then and they're still doing much today. But you know I can go right across the aisles here and we can hear stories and testimonies of others who are involved in ministries. You know, we were thinking of starting up a ministry where we do uh, strategize and plan and try to see how God can use us. So on Friday mornings, Lord willing, we're going to, we want to start up something and we're going to call it a uh, Be Live Ministry. And a Be Live Ministry is about, if we claim to be Christians, let's live it out in a way that uh, maybe as a group we're not doing and something that we can focus on. There's so many uh, areas in which people are involved now and we would like to hear from you. We would like to hear more of what motivated you to make that decision, that sacrifice financially, time-wise, why did you do it? And that's great to hear how God's people are doing that. But the Bible is a who, what, Bible book. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me to Psalm 113? I was reading this psalm this week, and as I came across this passage of Scripture, we see the who, what theme and principle mentioned. <coughs> Praise the Lord, Psalm 113 says. Praise, O O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. This is the who. The Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? The one who sits enthroned on high. Here's the, here's the what. Who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust 
and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of a child. Praise the Lord. We can get into great theological debate about who God is. But we also need to concern ourselves with what does God want from us? That Bible verse that John, uh, John read in Ephesians, by grace are we saved through faith and not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's to who God is. All grace, His love, sending His own dear Son to die on the cross for our sins. That's who God is. And then in verse 10, it says, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus and to good works. That's the what. What does God want us to do? Let's look at another uh, illustration of who God is and what He's done. We have a, uh, and maybe we can have some feedback on this little illustration. Jesus Christ coming down 
and dying on the cross for our sins. And bearing our sins in his own body. We're separated from God because of sin. And Jesus says, I'm going to go down to earth and I'm going to pay the penalty that they deserve and I'm going to die on that cross. So that they can have life and they could be freed from the penalty of sin and forgiven. And so that's what God has done for us. Who God is. This is what the Bible tells us and declares clearly. We have been saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And you know, for so many people who don't know the Lord, the hardest thing is to really understand, I don't need to do anything to get to heaven. I don't need to do anything to be forgiven. I just need to trust in Him mm -hmm. and put my faith in Him, the one who paid the price for me. That's the who God is and what He's done for us. And also the Bible does say, now what can we do? See, until we answer the who question is, we won't think of what we can do. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, the Damascus Road conversion we call it, in the King James, there's two questions that he asks. When the light brilliantly shines upon him, when he's going to Damascus to actually get Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem, and the light, the glory of the Lord, just shines brilliantly upon him, and he falls down, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Christ, the one you are persecuting. And the next question, what would you have me to do? Have you answered the who question? If you have, the next question is, what do you want me to do, God? You have a plan and a purpose for my life, as was stated by Jan, and is declared in the Bible. And so we want to ask that question to God. I had the opportunity of encouraging somebody, not directly, immediately. While we were discussing this, the leadership team, what can we do? Can we start? And we get the, you know, the wheels are turning and the juices are flowing and we're, you know, it's a power meeting. And we're saying, okay, how can we kind of do something differently? Uh, to complement the ministry, not to repeat it or duplicate it, but to complement it may cause us to stretch out of our safe boundaries. And while we're discussing it, we, I get a phone call. I say, well, we're in a meeting here. There's this person telling me about a mission. And I said, well, we're actually having a meeting and we're, 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 we're just, can I call you back? <coughs> and uh, this person, after we talk about what, our, you know, what would maybe be a good plan and the Lord, and we believe the Lord may be leading and where the Lord may be leading, I phoned this, this girl back and I, I asked her, okay, what, 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 what were you, you phoning me for? What, for what reason? What did you want me to hear? And she tells me about this ministry called Jet Ministry. And then she says, oh, we're, we're sending missionaries. Uh, what they do is uh, short-term missions. Young people in Quebec, they, they want to encourage young people to go on missions trips and to support them in any way they can, whether it's prayerfully, financially, and both. I said, really? I said, that's what we were just talking about. I said, send me everything you got. She said, what? I said, send it all. Tell me about it. We want to know. This is exactly what we want to get involved in. And uh, so she sent me this this brochure with all kinds of information of names of families and people that are planning to go on short-term missions. These are the kinds of things that are happening all around us and we want to engage ourselves to be informed. And so she was so encouraged. But it was really because we had just been talking about it. And sure enough, we had a, a phone call. While we're praying that same day, we get a, I get another phone call. Man, we're praying. We're spiritual. Stop phoning. So, I'm on the phone. It's Relief Canada. 
that? Yes, okay. Well, we're praying about how we can help you. So just, can you leave us alone? <laughs> sure you guys turn, but... Okay, okay, Mr. Greenwood, thank you very much, but I'll phone you back. <laughs> so, we, we finished praying, a spiritual guys, and then I phoned her back. Relief Canada, yes. I mean, every year we have some type of cause, but this year we want to do things different, the girl says. We want you to uh, ask the people what their cause is. And we're going to have uh, some type of paper that you can put your cause on. Something that you people are passionate about and you want to support. I said, really? I said, send us everything you got. <laughs> this is during one meeting, two phone calls. This has got to be the Lord's leading, folks. I'm just sharing you what was happening that day. So she's in the process of sending us all this stuff. And we're going to talk about this stuff. And we're going to have a, a meeting on Friday for anybody who would like to uh, be a part of this. Uh, this Friday, this coming Friday at 10.30. And we're going to talk about uh, some of these things. What can we do? We're going to consider the scriptures. What... Where is God leading? What does God say? So you read through the book of Acts. The Apostle Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? What would you have me to do? We're going to ask that question. We, we know the answer. Who Jesus is. But sometimes we're not so clear on, What do you want me to do, Lord? We want to try to work together. Are there things in our community? Are there things abroad? Tony would love to have you uh, share about prison ministry and what's going on in the prisons. How can we pray for you? We hear you're, you're going there and Carol's going to be starting up Samaritan's Purse. These are things that are going on and there's more of you involved. But We just want to kind of, if we can be more on the same page and that we're on with vision uh, ministries and missionaries. We want to hear what's going on. I want to be more... You know, I was a missionary myself. And uh, for a few years, we were we were in children's ministry and we were Canadian Sunday School missions. But you know, I would have to say uh, I've been negligent in being informed about what's going on. Sometimes, as a pastor now, you get so preoccupied with things so specifically concerning yourself and the church that you lose the bigger picture. What's going on? I've preached many times. It, whenever you're looking too much at yourself, take your eyes off of yourself and look up. But you know, sometimes I haven't practiced what I've preached. But I want to force myself. I want to for myself, because I think it's the right thing to do. And by God's grace, we want to get involved in what's going on out there, uh, even in our own backyard. So we can see that uh, God reveals His glory when it says, Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, but who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? There's a wonderful book uh, written by Chuck Swindoll, and it, he talks about grace, grace ministry, and he dem he talks about five character five characteristics of those who serve in grace. Those who serve in grace. Paul, in writing to Timothy, says this: "Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus." In Second Timothy, chapter two. Be strong in the grace. Indeed, Chuck Swindoll in his book, The Grace Awakening, says this. May grace your aim, your pursuit, your passion, model it, teach it, demonstrate it. It's all about grace. God's riches, Christ's expense that we've experienced in our lives. First characteristic of true grace is generosity with personal possessions. Absence of selfishness. 
He gives that as the num number one characteristic of uh, what it means to live by grace. There's that, uh, again, in reading through the book of Acts, you read the early church, they were taking their funds, they were selling their homes, they were doing whatever, and they were bringing them together and giving them. And we're not asking you to do that, for sure. That's not the purpose of this. But we see when there's grace and we know when the Lord is uh, tugging at the, our heartstrings to give. To give. And we give graciously. God loves uh, a cheerful giver. But generosity with personal possessions. Isn't that the gospel message in a nutshell? That Jesus Christ in all of his glory came down to earth. He humbled himself and was fashioned in the form of a man. Though he was God. Secondly, five characteristics of, the, who's, of those who serve in grace is to seek encouragement in unusual settings. There's the absence of predictability. I was encouraged with you folks uh, for our ceremony, the exchanging of our vows yesterday for Nancy. Myself. What came it was just a thought and an idea transpired into just a, an event that took the work and effort of many people. That we couldn't have pulled this off, as I said last night, without you folks generously. And I, it came, in, in a sense, it was an unusual setting. It wasn't planned on, but all of a sudden people just started to take the bull by the horns and it became almost this hurricane <laughs> Irene type thing. Oh, no, where did I start? I didn't mean this. And all of a sudden, people were volunteering their time and efforts and finances and uh, it was just a blessing. You know, I, I was just thinking of, uh, of you folks giving. I was going over my mind last night and <laughs> thinking, wow. I can't believe that these folks are And uh, it was just a blessing. But in so many ways, that's the best in ways to be encouraged, is when it comes in an unusual setting. It's not planned or predicted, but poof, all of a sudden. Yeah, that's grace. As well, it's life beyond the letter of Scripture. Oh, for those of you who are theologians, I'm not saying that we compromise the Word of God, but that we, we are careful to use the Word of God appropriately. Let me give you an example. Turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Jesus is walking this earth, and all He wants to do is meet the needs of the hungry, meet the needs of the helpless, and here in Luke chapter 6, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. Luke chapter 6, verse 1. And his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priest eat. And he also gave some of his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, God did not create us so that we could uh, live by the Sabbath. God gave us the Sabbath for a purpose, a time of rest. But it's not a legalistic holiday. The Pharisees were looking at a day, the Sabbath is legalism. And they had set up a bunch of rules, the, the do's and don'ts of what you could and couldn't do on a certain day of the week. And because they became so legalistic, they were even misusing the scriptures when they were saying, uh, it is unlawful to take uh, grain, in other words, to feed yourself if you were hungry from, the, from a field. And of course they were misquoting the scripture because if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23, it doesn't say that it's illegal or wrong to take from there.
But in Deuteronomy chapter 23, and I just want to turn to it quickly, just for an example of showing you what legalism does, when you try to live by the letter of the law, and you're trying to blow everybody out of the water with your theological revolver, look what happens in verse 25 of Deuteronomy chapter 23. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, which they did, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to the standing grain. In other words, you can definitely make sure that you're not starving to death and you can eat, because then they would be stealing, and of course stealing is wrong. But that's not what they were doing. They weren't using a sickle so that they could pick all kinds of grain. That was the misquoting of scripture, and that's what legalism does. It is so preoccupied with trying to correct people that eventually it misquotes. And it puts people in bondage. And Jesus wanted to free people from legalism. Jesus reserved his harshest, harshest words for who? This, the religious type, the Pharisees, who had no relationship with God. They understood in one sense who God was. But they were so blinded by their uh, Pharisees that they couldn't see past them. They couldn't see that Jesus was actually doing a good thing. And then again, look what happens on the next Sabbath. In verse 6, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. That's what Phariseeism does. It looks for reasons. And I've met people like that. That they're looking for reasons to correct you. To say, oh, we couldn't go to that church. Again, the Bible does encourage us and exhort us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that we can be more effective servants. Not that so we can keep ourselves in bondage to legalism. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy? It's a very simple question. Very profound, very simple. And he looked around, and all of a sudden, his critics were silenced. Mm -hmm. had, but, it says, they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. So we see that uh, when we think of, of the Word of God, let's not be... Pharisees in the way we study the Word of God and judge people. Life beyond the letter of Scripture. Absence of dogmatic Bible bashing. That's living in grace. Liberty for creative <coughs> expression is number four. Absence of expectations. Creative expression. God has created us as, as individuals with our unique personalities and talents and gifts, God wants to use us. And he's good with electricity. God said, I'm sending you to Africa. <laughs> but there's so many opportunities for our creative expression to use what we've got. Not to be ashamed of who we are, but God made us a certain way to be used for Him. And God wants us to enjoy the freedom of serving Him how He's made us. Not how someone else tells us we should be, and who we should be, and what we should do. But you see, that's the, the part of uh, living by grace that's important. And finally, and this is most importantly, folks, I need this one every day if I want to live by grace. Because every day Satan can say to God, that guy, friend, you know what he's like. You know the things he's done. Surely, he can't say, he can't preach. He can't stand in front of people. He can't do this or do that because he's a sinner. 
He's done wrong things. Released, living by grace means we're released from past failures. There's the absence of shame. The absence of shame. We realize that in one sense it's true, every day we're condemned. If it was based upon our own good works to get to heaven. Every day as a Christian I still fall short of God's perfect will for my life. Whether in actions or in thoughts, in deeds or words, I fall short. But yet I'm reminded that every day, every new day, what does lamentation do? He says, I love that verse. Every day his mercies are new, his compassions are new. Great is his faithfulness. I love waking up in the morning and saying, thank you for this new day, Lord. You've given me a new day of opportunities. And if there's anything that I've done wrong, I want to confess these things and I want to start that new day. Knowing, Lord, that you're with me. Knowing, Lord, that you have a will and a purpose and a plan for me. Don't let Satan whisper into your ear, you're not good enough. None of us are good enough. It's all by grace. It's all by grace. So, my friends, may we be encouraged this morning that... Uh, by grace are you saved. By grace we are saved. Mm -hmm. Yet we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The question I have for you, are you a who, what Christian? Like the Apostle Paul was. Who art thou? Have, have you answered, has that God answered that question for you? Have you said, who are you? Who are you, God? God is Jesus Christ. <laughs> came down and died on the cross for your sins. If you haven't done business with God as of yet and dealt with that question, maybe today is a great day to do that. Recognizing that you can leave here saying, Jesus is my Savior. Maybe this morning you've answered that question. You're saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And maybe you've been a Christian for 1, 2, 10, 15, 20 years. There's a new chapter. Yesterday was a new chapter for me. Mm -hmm. 25 years. Well, actually, if I can be legalistic, it's not until the 13th of September. So I'm still in the first 25 years. <laughs> but all the mushy stuff, that's the new me. <laughs> no, that's not the new me. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> God is good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that you've blessed us with. Oh, God. Thank you for the testimony of your people. Oh, Lord. You call us in the place where we're at. You're like a good fisherman, oh, Lord. You catch us before you clean us. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord, for all of those who truly can say, Jesus Christ, you are my Savior, oh, Lord, may we be saying, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Help me not to be stagnant, Lord, in my walk with you, as you would know in my own life, the times and occasions when, there's, when indifference settles in. Shake me out of that indifference. Put me in the place where I'm uncomfortable and I can't rely upon self, but I need to rely upon you. Teach me to live, not by law, but by grace. Father, I thank you for each one. As we go our separate ways, may your presence indeed in our lives cause us to look inwardly and outwardly for your glory and who art thou, Lord, and what would thou have me to do? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.